Okay, hey everyone, it's Marcus and welcome to more Zooming in the Jungle Room. Today I am so freaking blessed because I am getting the boy from Bogengate right here live with me on Zoom. He is of course Mitchell Coombs. How are you Mitchell? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. You know what they say, you can take the boy out of Bogengate, but you can't take the bogan out of the boy. I don't know. Yeah, no, nah, it's definitely with with me to this day, <laughs> the boganness of it all. Um, hey, let's go back to the beginning. I mean, when that video went viral, the Bogan Gate video, I mean, that was just all over the news. It was everywhere. Mm. How was that time in your life when, you know, you were just famous all around Australia and parts of the world as well? I mean, it was very, um, very exciting because... Um, I mean, it was great for the ego, wasn't it? <laughs> because I had kind of always wanted to make YouTube videos and stuff and had never done it, never been brave enough. And this was like the first video I'd made on my own before. And then it blew up. So as I said, great for the ego, um, yeah. but also like highly terrifying as well, because I, I didn't intend for it to go viral. That was a total accident. I actually, um, I'd been living in Sydney away from Bogengate. So I'd only been living out of home for a year. And then when I came back for Christmas, I made this video giving a tour of Bogengate just for my friends back in Sydney, because no one seems to believe me when I say <laughs> that the town is called Bogengate. People think it's not a real place. And so, yeah, I just kind of made it with no intention of it blowing up. And then when it did, it was, um, yeah, a bit, a bit overwhelming, especially because every day it just kept snowballing. One day it was, you know, 25,000 views. Next next minute it's on Sunrise, Daily Telegraph. It's just, it just kept blowing up. Everywhere. And um. I kind of buried my head in the sand a little bit. I remember at one point my dad said to me, oh, mate, all those nasty comments, just ignore them. And I hadn't <laughs> even been looking at the comments. So I was like, what nasty comments? Thanks, Dad. And so I, I had a quick, quick look. It actually wasn't that nasty in hindsight. I've had way worse since. It was just like, oh, the only guy in the village, people saying stuff like that. But at the time it was very daunting because I hadn't ever put myself out there in that way. Um, yeah, so, yeah, in a nutshell, exciting, but also terrifying. And how did it affect your dating life? Did that change dramatically? My dating life? Yeah. I don't think it really affected my dating life at all. I hadn't had much of a dating life. That first year <laughs> living in Sydney, I was still very much a shy kid. I'd been on a few dates, nothing um, nothing to write home about. But um, I actually don't think it made much of a difference at all, to be honest, to my dating life. Okay. All right. Well, okay. I mean, obviously, the big question is, I mean, for those of you that have seen um, the a video that we are talking about, and I'll put a link to it, um, you know, with this video. Um, but do you know the difference now between a snake and a lizard? Everyone needs to know. <laughs> of course, I know the difference. I've always known. But when you see something freaking slimy and scaly slithering along the ground in the like dead heat of summer... Your first thought is brown snake. Oh, it's just kind of drilled into you as a country kid. So I was like terrified. But yes, we know it's a lizard now. It was fine. It can't hurt. When you just said sneaky and slimy, I thought you were talking about my dating life at that point. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I, my my head did go there as well. But I thought, no mind out of the gutter, Mitchell. But never mind. I've just realised what sort of program I've agreed to be on. I'm oh, on yeah. board. And here we are, we're setting the tone, Mitchell. Um, <laughs> of course, you are coming to Adelaide with your show. Um, it is going to be appearing at the Howling Owl on Friday the 28th of June. I was just saying to you off air, it is my birthday. So I'm going to come and celebrate my birthday with you seeing your show. Um, now tell us about the you show. you want me to get everyone to sing happy birthday to you? I get requests like that sometimes. <laughs> I want lap dancers. I want, I want everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about the show because obviously um, it did come here last year I think it was for Feast Festival correct me if I'm wrong um, yeah, so it feels like only five minutes ago that I was in Adelaide with this show uh -huh. but I'm coming back baby hey he's back it's the encore show tell us about for the people who didn't actually see it last year what is the show about well on that note there actually were quite a few people that didn't see it last year I think I might have been a bit rubbishing a, a bit rubbish at marketing myself because people kept <laughs> like coming up to me in Adelaide. I think people are very friendly. Like at the airport, before I'd even entered Adelaide properly, there were three people that stopped me and said, oh my God, I love your videos. What are you doing here? And I said, I'm here for my show. And they're like, what show? And I said, it's, it's on tonight and tomorrow night. They're like, oh, bugger, I've got plans. So in a way I'm coming back because there's a lot of people that didn't even freaking know I was doing a show this, uh, when I was there last year. But um, yeah, the show is called Water for Ducks Clit. Um, it is my second uh, headline show and um, yeah 
the the whole the whole idea came about. I really just came up with the name and worked backwards, honestly, because um, <laughs> I have this running joke with my friends where we like we'll say a sentence that involves a body part, like it might be, you know, I don't know. You can't pull the wool over my eyes, but substitute the body part with clit. So, you know, nice no skin off my clit, things like that. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> and then Water for Ducks clit was born out of that stupid inside joke. And then um, I kind of just worked the show around it, around the concept. I think I've tied it in well. You've done okay. And so how did the reviews go last year? Was it received well? Um, yeah, well, it's received well. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go because I... um. It was my second show, like I mentioned. I'd done an hour-long show before that, the year prior. Um, and it was called Can You Stand It? The post is right behind me. Actually. I can see it, yeah. <laughs> my partner got that frame for me, isn't he, sweet? <laughs> um, so, yeah, the first show, when it came to writing that one, it was like, it just word vomited out of me. There was no writer's block. I was feeling motivated. I bashed a lot of that show out just in the space of one flight, really. But then putting together Water for Ducks clip, I was really nervous because I had like massive writer's block. And you know that icky feeling that some creators talk about when it's like, oh, when it feels forced, then it's just not right. So this one, it didn't feel forced, but it was definitely like, I think I was a bit harder on myself. The stakes felt a bit higher because I was like, oh, it's my second show. I've got to make it better. And because it didn't flow quite as freely and I had to really like force myself, to pull the show together, it did feel a bit forced. And so I had my doubts, but then people that had been to both shows, they'd come back to see the new one, said that this one was a drastic improvement. So I was like, oh, well, <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> and so like I guess it doesn't really matter if it feels forced or not. You just have to bloody get it done. Exactly. So when you um, are in the process of putting on a new show, creating a new show, what kind of headspace do you like to be in? Do you like to go out in the community and, you know, see what's around you and get inspired by that? Or do you like to close yourself away and just write? How do you do a new show? A little bit of both, to be honest. Um, like I said, the first, um, the first show that I did, I, I had a lot of motivation. I bashed it out in one flight and I was trying to recreate that when I had writer's block um, <laughs> for this new show that I'm doing which has chopped and changed a lot over the, the year and a bit that I've been doing it. Um, and so because I was struggling with motivation, I was like, well, I can't just book a freaking flight for the sake of it, just hoping that that will give me motivation. So I'll do the Povo version. I'll catch a train. <laughs> so I uh -huh. caught a train to the Blue Mountains, which is like, you know, one of the furthest spots you can go on the train line. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'll be able to bash out so much material it didn't quite have the same <laughs> like uh -huh. creative burst of motivation looking out the window of a train or the scabby graffitied fences and stuff <laughs> that didn't really inspire me a bit um and so it, it really depends it can come to me randomly in the middle of the night i'll bash something out or it'll come to me if i force myself to sit there at the desk but in terms of like what headspace i need to be in interestingly this show came out of not a very good headspace. The whole show is kind of, in a nutshell, it's about mental health because um, it was actually, are you familiar with M. Rossiano? Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah, love her. So she's like, she's been very good to me. She's been a very encouraging, giving me advice and stuff. And when it came to her advice about writer's block, she said, just tell your story. And the fact of the matter was that at the time, my story was that I was going through quite the rough patch when it came to the old mental health. And so I, I just, I don't know, made light of that, talked about trying to crawl out of that rough patch, doing all the self-improvement and just making fun of all the things yeah. that come with that. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no stranger to finding humour in quite dark places. So that's what <laughs> the show is about in a way. And then I've sort of tied that in with the whole water off a duck's clip thing. There was someone at my Newcastle show that said, I loved the way you tied it all together with the water off the duck's water off a duck's clip message it was like art they said i'm like okay i wouldn't go that far i okay. literally, yeah. but you know, I literally just thought of the name and then thought of the rest later but sure <laughs> we'll go with that cheers um yeah you probably mentioned um the person now um m but um i was just going to ask you who is one of your comedian role models that you really look up to you know you follow um that inspires you and inspires your career um, well, yeah, em, em Rossiano is a big one um, because, yeah, she's she's been good to me. I look up to her a lot. Um, she's like, she's a big voice for the neurodiverse of the world, like myself. And um, <laughs> she also doesn't just do stand-up, you know, she's she's a podcaster, she's on radio, she's a writer. And so, 
yeah, I admire that about her as well. Um, she's got a lot of passion, which I also look up to. Um, outside of M. Rossiano, it's a lot of female comedians, actually. People like Judith Lucy, Kitty Flanagan, always loved them growing up. Um, Julia Morris as well, love her. That's actually, I have to confess, I stole the whole phrase, can you stand it, which was the name of my first show. That whole phrase I stole from her because um, she came out on stage at the Logies one year and says, oh, she's gotten so thin, can you stand it? And I just thought that was <laughs> such a good line. And so I started using that almost as a catchphrase. People recognised that from my videos whenever yeah. I was going on some sort of rant. I'd be like, oh, God, can you stand it? And so I stole that from Julia. I did actually get her on the podcast at one point to um, get her blessing to seal that from her. She doesn't even remember. She doesn't even remember saying it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I was able to pick that up, pick, you know, run with that, make it my own. Um, that's all female comedians, isn't it? Reese Nicholson, adore him. Another oh, he's person hilarious. I've met on the podcast. Hilarious. And you know how they say, like, don't meet your heroes? I was a bit nervous about having Reese on the podcast, but no, nah, he's so chill, very down to earth. Have you met somebody that's disappointed? Actually, you probably can't say. Oh, you know what? Let's call it like it is, Mitchell. All right. And um, have you met somebody, you know, like you say, uh, you don't want to meet your heroes. Have you met someone and be like, oh, yeah, you know what? Maybe I should have stuck by that phrase. Who's disappointed? Um, no one's disappointed me, really, in terms of comedians. There was one time that I met Geraldine Hickey. And it's a funny story. It wasn't a disappointment. It was more just me overthinking the situation because... um. As a TikToker, um, TikTok Australia asked me, oh, do you want to go backstage at the Sydney Comedy Festival Gala? You know, like the showcase they do with a bunch of different comedians on the lineup at the start of Sydney Comedy Festival. So they said, do you want us to get you a backstage pass on the proviso that you film TikTok content with the comedians? And so they got me backstage. And you can imagine these poor freaking comedians who were trying to get in the zone about to go on stage being told there's a TikToker here who's just going to film something silly with you and they all just kind of went oh god really like can you think of anything worse <laughs> when you're about to go on stage being harassed by some influencer and um I decided what I would do in the video would just I'd just ask every single one of them the biggest question every comedian hates being asked which is oh you're a comedian tell us a joke and so I hit every single one of them with that and Geraldine's answer was knock knock I said, who's there? She said, no one. Who the fuck would be knocking on your door? And she committed to the bit so much that I walked away being like, she wants me dead. Wants me. Oh my God. But then like maybe a year later, she was part of another lineup and I just bumped into her on the street outside after the show. And she says to me, I remember you, you're that kid that was filming the TikTok. You, you're funny. And I was like, Thank God. I thought you really, really hated me. And I was also really, really impressed that she remembered. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, I mean, clearly this career is taking off for you and you're just going gangbusters. I think this time around in <laughs> Adelaide, which will be in June, which is only a month away. Um, mm -hmm. you know, fingers crossed it's that absolutely sold out at the howling owl. Um, but um, but before this career really took off for you, what were you probably going to do as your career or a trade or something like that? Did you have a um, another plan in your life at that point? Um, well, I kind of got to a point because I, I came to Sydney to do like media studies, radio school, and I was doing like a digital producer job at a radio station. So I was making, you know, bloody TikToks for Kyle and Jackie O for four years. And um, I was happy with that. I had no other plans in mind. But it got to a point where I was like so severely burnt out from waking up early and also not really looking after myself when you're doing like 4 a.m. starts every day for four years. You kind of have to let go of the party lifestyle that someone in their early 20s might be accustomed to. Which <laughs> I did not. I just decided to keep partying, keep drinking, not looking after myself and continuing to get up at 4 a.m. I wonder why I burnt out. It's such a mystery to me. <laughs> um, and so I left that job with the intention of just taking a gap year. It's now been three years. So <laughs> um, the last three years, I've kind of just been, you know, if a door opens, I'll walk through it, give it a crack, which is kind of what this stand-up comedy thing was. I thought I could have actually hated it myself because I've always been a shy kid, hated public speaking. And so I thought I could hate this and just give it up like that. But I ended up falling in love with it. Do you look at yourself now, um, you know, you say you're a shy kid. When, as a child, I was quite shy as well. Um, but do you look at yourself now, um, you know, a self-confessed um, shy kid, 
um, and think, you know, how proud you are that, you know, you've gone into territories that, you know, that shy kid as a child would have never even thought or dreamt was even possible. You know, do you kind of put pat yourself on the back occasionally and go, yeah, you know what, Mitchell, you're awesome. I do, I do, because it's it's a weird contradiction because yeah. I'm not saying I used to be a shy kid. Like, I still am very much day to day. Like, I'm a, I'm a shy person and yep. um, I'm not, you know, the class clown, attention seeker, whatever. Um, and I actually just don't understand where it comes from, the ability to go on stage and just, like, be able to perform. It's very, it's very strange to me that I was able to do that and that I was... Um, I don't want to say it came naturally to me because that sounds like I'm full of myself, but you know what I mean? Like the way that I was able to do that. And I still get nervous, obviously, in a in the same way that most comedians still get nervous, like healthy nerves. It's good not to be. It's I think if you're not nervous, that's a problem, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it still does blow my mind in a way when I think back to like being 14, 15, crippling social anxiety, being like, holy shit, now I go on stage and film myself and whatever. Like, it's all, it's all very weird. I don't know how I got here, but I'm not mad about it. Going with it. Just going with the flow. Yeah. Hey, let's touch on mental health for a minute, because obviously mental health is a huge thing and it affects everybody, whether we admit it or not. Um, and, you know, some worse than others, of course. But um, if you're having a dark day, a down day, a sad day, a bad day, whatever. What inspires you? How do you turn that day around? What have you, what tools have you learned to actually turn a bad day into an awesome day? <laughs> Maybe you should tell me what tools I should give a crack because I'd love to be able to give you a clear answer. No, yeah. um, it's just like focusing on your needs, I think has been a big thing for me in recent times. Like the whole mentality when I was going through that whole burnout period, working that really grueling job was just like, nah, nah, soldier on. And I was not putting my needs first. I was not paying attention to even the messages my body was sending me about like, you need to rest. You need to not pour another glass of wine. Um, just really paying attention to my needs and being able to prioritize myself a bit more in that way. Um, and also just the really freaking boring basic advice, like, okay, if I'm feeling shit, I'm going to go for a bike ride. That'll make me feel a bit better, a bit of fresh air. Yeah. Um, but also one thing that in all honesty keeps me going is that um, there's a lot said about trolls online, but I've also experienced the vast majority of people that I've interacted with online have been like beautiful, absolutely lovely. And I've had enough messages along the lines of, keep being you, you brighten my day. I was having a shit day, but you put a smile on my face, something like that. So those sorts of things really do help keep me going. I sometimes will take a screenshot, put it in a little album, be like, right, I need to remember this when I'm feeling shit Good. because that'll, that'll help. Mitchell, you know what I do? I just go out and buy another bloody plant. I Simple. hadn't even noticed. <laughs> I didn't all these freaking plants behind you. Yeah, I'm sworn off pot plants. I can't deal because my house got full of those little, what are those little mite things that? Oh yeah, the, the fruit flies. Oh the the yeah the gnats. The gnats. They're not friendly. Yeah, they're... the fucking gnats. They're horrible. And I thought I was doing all this research on how to get rid of them, and I thought I actually just cannot be bothered. I'm not a plant guy. Right. I've accepted it. Also, yeah. my cat's allergic to most There's plants. A plant behind you. The That's only the ones that she. <laughs> Is that a fake oh, one? Of course it's fake. Look, it's even fake, like, potting mix. I can take it upside down. <laughs> All my plants no are fake now because I don't want to murder my cat, for starters. But also, <laughs> I just, I'm not a plant guy, and I'm happy to admit that. Yeah, okay. I get it. I get it. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more question, um, and then we're going to wrap up sure. and talk about the show. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, so what kind of challenges are there any challenges involved in being a comedian these days because you know obviously everyone is so sensitive and you have to be so careful about offending people etc um what kind of challenges do you find with your style of comedy um <laughs> i get away with a lot more on the stage than i do in let's say my podcast or my videos or what have you i um yeah i'm far more offensive <laughs> at the comedy <laughs> show because it does feel like a bit of a safe space. Yep. Um, yes, the shows are being recorded. No one else is filming me, but I tend to have the shows filmed for social media. I just won't post the offensive bits. That's the <laughs> in the room. Um, I guess one of the challenges, like I mentioned, was the writing block situation. Yep. Um, in my case, one of the challenges is just fucking 
memorizing it. Like I go so rogue. Every show of mine is a little bit different because I just will flat out forget a whole chunk of the show. I will, I will just add something random that I've ad libbed there. Um, and so I, I'm not one of those comedians that can memorize everything word for word, like a script. I, I hate that. That feels like studying for a bloody high school exam. I can't do uh -huh. it. Um, and so I've got me dot points. I stick to it mostly, but yeah, there's a lot of shit in every show that you wouldn't get in any other show. Um, one of the other challenges I would say, just from my perspective is that I didn't like the way I got into comedy was like getting a big social media following first and then being handed the opportunity to do a show, which yep. is kind of how it came about. You know, I was connected with a promoter who was like, yeah, you've got followers. That's logical. People will buy tickets. Here's a show. And so, yeah, I had imposter syndrome going into that because I was like, oh my God, I haven't, I haven't fucking earned me stripes. I haven't been doing open mics and lineups and what have you for years, perfecting my craft. I'm just kind of being thrown in the deep end here. And mm. long story short, a lot of the people in the uh, comedian world don't take lightly to my kind. They don't like my kind, the mm. ones that have come from TikTok. <laughs> but um, I have been, you know, trying to do a lot more open mics and line up stuff so that I do feel like I've, you know, I'm not just winging it. I'm not just some kid from TikTok who happens to have a show. Yeah. Um, I, I think there might have been a shift recently in the last year where I'm not a TikToker who happens to do comedy. I think people are starting to see me as a comedian who happens yeah. to have TikTok. Um, so I think the shift is happening. But yeah, certainly at first I noticed there was, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, plenty of beautiful, lovely people in the comedy world. I've got some gorgeous friends, but yes, I'm well aware of um, some people that aren't a fan of particularly me, but because of the reason of how I got into comedy. Well, I think you're fabulous. All of your fans think you're fabulous. And there's a plethora of <laughs> Thank you. them. Um, everyone, you need to get out, buy tickets for Water Offer Duck's Clit. You need to come see the show to see how he ties it in, because he does, as he explains. Um, he um, is Mitchell Coombs, playing at the Howling Owl in Adelaide, in the East End, just over there. Um, Friday, the 28th of June, which is my birthday. Come and celebrate with me by seeing Mitchell Coombs in Adelaide, everybody. Mitchell Coombs, you are an absolute delight. Like you're a champion and you're super duper funny. Oh, thank you very much. I can't wait to see you on your birthday. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Bye. Pleasure. Bye.